This is an EC-135 PT Plus helicopter located at Sweetwater, Tennessee. The heliport is 37 Tango November. That's a UT Lost Star heliport. Uh, this helicopter has been here about two years. It was uh, new in November of 2009. We have uh, 1,440 hours on it now. It's been a great helicopter. It's a single pilot IFR machine. It has a crew of three, a pilot, and a paramedic, and a nurse and we carry one patient. Also have provisions in the left seat to carry usually the paramedic in the left seat uh, en route to the scene or en route to a uh, hospital or a heliport, wherever it is we're going to pick up the patient. At that point the, we land and the paramedic gets out with the nurse and they take care of the patient in the back while the pilot flies either VFR or IFR uh, to whatever the nearest uh, hospital is which has an instrument approach or, or a uh, airport and then we'll transition from there VFR to a nearby trauma center or hospital. Uh, it's been a great aircraft, very reliable, has uh, two autopilots. Both of them are extremely reliable. Uh, really enjoy uh, flying it. It's uh, very stable and like I said the autopilot is just rock solid. It will not kick off. Uh, it's got a glass cockpit. It's got the Garmin uh, 530 and the 430. It's got a GMX 200 multifunction display has a XM weather built into the 200 uh, Garmin system and also has a physical radar located in the nose which is also controlled by through the uh, multifunction display on the instrument panel. A uh, great aircraft, very stable. In the back it's uh, outfitted for uh, EMS. And you can see below the sliding door on the right side here that's the uh, number two uh, oxygen tank. An identical one is located on the left side so those are oxygen tanks? Yes. Okay. And each one is maxed out at 1,840 PSI. It's just like the airlines. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, behind the uh, aft cowling there is a Pratt & Whitney 206 series engine. And forward of that cowling is the uh, engine slash transmission oil cooler. And then forward of that compartment is the uh, inlet for the engine and transmission oil cooler. All right. So this first vent up here, semi-circular vent, what's that for? This, yeah, this one right here. That just feeds into the uh, uh, engine and transmission okay. compartment. But the main inlet is in the front of Yeah, it's in the front. Okay. You think, well, looking at it from the side, that this is one big long engine, you know, but not, not quite. So uh, actually, the airflow for the engines comes through the uh, top cowling. Oh, in, really? In the turtle. Uh -huh. And so the airflow goes down through the transmission. Then makes a 90 degree turn and it goes straight back and, all, and makes another 90 degree turn downward into each engine. Okay. And uh, for whatever reason, it's really good airflow. I don't have any problem with yeah. uh, uh, critical engines due to uh, uh, yaw or what have, whatever. Uh -huh. it's, it's a really good system. Apparently so it's so. not the primary intake, that's mainly for the cooling and stuff, yeah. is the front. It's entirely. Oh, for, for the cooling. Yeah, for the oh. transmission and engine oil cooling. And so. Uh, nice trivia question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, behind that aft count, compartment there. That's uh -huh. our lead acid battery. Uh, okay, and, right there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then here we have the uh, uh, primary access for the patient clamshell doors. Right. They have a couple of latches here. It opens up. This is how the patient's loaded on. The aircraft has an integral uh, litter which locks in. Oh yeah. And then they carry whatever medical gear which they may need on the right side here. And they have a uh, they usually select what they need for the scene and then if they need something particular to come back and get it. Um, and that's a portable oxygen bottle there if they need that. But the aircraft has built-in oxygen and all the other. Yeah, very nice. Thank you. Sir. And then uh, here underneath the tail boom, we have two radar altimeter antennas. Okay. Uh, very accurate. Use that on our precision approaches and also just for information when we're making an approach. Uh, have a radar altimeter, obviously. Uh, VOR antennas, port and starboard. Uh, tail rotor is covered up by the cover, goes back to the Fenestron tail boom. Uh, got 10 blades. Interesting thing about the 10 blades in this Finistron is that the uh, 
blades are installed irregularly. And what that does, as opposed to the HH-65 or the MH-65 series Dolphin helicopter that the Coast Guard has, it doesn't have a uh, high pitch whine on the tow rotors. It's a lot quieter. Uh, oh, yeah, I can see that now. I can mm -hmm. see the offset. And yeah. what, what happens if you have the blades equally spaced, it creates a harmonic vibration or a harmonic uh, pitch. And it's very penetrating. And so what they've done, the guys at uh, Eurocopter, is they discovered by breaking up the uh, distance in between the blades, it creates a node. And so it sort of silences the, uh, the resonance. Oh, so wow. It's very okay. quiet. It sounds like, a, like an ultralight helicopter flying over the tow rotor. Very right. Quiet. Well, I've heard they talk about... Uh, the Festron is uh, quieter, but no one has ever mentioned the fact of the asymmetric, you know. Location? Yeah, and now, I, you know, it's clear as day now. But again, you don't get that many opportunities to get close to one, you know, the tail. One of the nice things about the Fenestron is that, first of all, it's enclosed inside the shroud. And so uh, when we load a patient hot, obviously the, uh, the people that are assisting us are approaching from the front of the aircraft, and then they'll be assisted by the med crew. And they'll keep them away from the from the finisher on a course, but uh -huh. even if something did go really bad, it's pretty hard to get yourself in trouble. Uh, on uh, the right. We normally keep people well forward of the stabilizers. Uh huh. But still, it's very safe and very difficult to get hurt around it. Now, my understanding is the bottom fin is mainly a bumper. Is That's that correct? Okay. But still has a little bit of offset for uh, uh, lateral lift. Right. Okay. So, uh, basically, as you can see, the uh, main fin here yeah. is offset and, and creating lift in this direction and uh, it's flat on the on the left side. Because yeah, that helps with the lateral tendency. Yeah. Well, well, not it, really. It, Obviously it, if you're hovering it has no effect. But. Well, what happens is in forward flight uh, it streamlines the aircraft and it's a fairly short aircraft so they, they put a large vertical fin on it huh. to uh, create a substantial amount of uh, sideward lift and stabilize the aircraft in flight. And so if we did have a complete catastrophic failure of the finister, keep our speed up, say around 70 knots plus, the aircraft would continue to fly perfectly normally without having any uh, loss of uh, yaw control. Oh, okay. So it's, it's a very good system, just keep your speed up. Right, right. And uh, here's the gearbox here covered up by this wrap. got a couple of uh, like electro mechanical controls going back to here. It's a three axis auto autopilot pitch roll. Oh, nice. And uh, yaw doesn't have a collective mode, it's not a four axis autopilot. That's that's okay. okay. Uh, just, uh, Can you gauge both autopilots at the same time for redundancy? or? Well, they're, they're always there. And so if the number one fails, the number uh -huh. two automatically kicks in. Kicks in. It's a beautiful thing. Okay, because I know on Autoland you can gauge both autopilots. For, for mega redundancy, you know, for the, but obviously you're letting the plane do the work. Right, well this one has two autopilots, the, the, the number one is primary and two is secondary. If the one fails, uh, the second one just automatically. It's, it's right there. Right. Okay. What you would need on an approach, of course. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And of course it is a single pilot IFR aircraft. Well, that, that's for the certification then, yes. otherwise you'd have to have two pilots. Yes, right. right, okay. And it's a, it's a very low workload. Uh, so uh, here we have the uh, finlets on both sides to stabilize the aircraft. Basically, they, uh, the engineers trimmed it up so it flies straight at normal cruise speeds, which are around 120, 125 knots, the typical load that we have. The max gross weight of this aircraft is 2,910 kilograms, and we probably fly around picking up patients around 2,750, 2,800, fairly routinely. And we service, uh, right now we're sitting at 950 feet above sea level, and nearby us is uh, Mount Leconte. Uh -huh. If you go up there, it's 7,000 feet MSL. Uh -huh. The aircraft, we've gone up there and landed and picked up patients no problem. frequently. You, you uh, don't have to do any type of transitional lift, takeoffs, or anything? Well, I don't or? want to go up there at max gross weight. Right, I want okay. I sure plan my weight properly. Gotcha. But it will do the job. Well, see, that's, that's the key, doing the job that's that it's designed right. for. Yeah. And, uh, now, I've noticed that some of the EC-135s, they don't have these exhaust ports here. What's What are these this for? It's an air conditioner. Oh, so it's an optional thing. Right. Okay. Right. And we've got a bunch of uh, supplemental equipment on the aircraft. The uh, medical kit uh, we're, we're, uh, stipulates a lot of the things like the air Right. Some of the electronics need it. Right. Okay. And, well, uh, see, that makes sense because on some of them, I'm like, wait a second. That doesn't have them on. Okay. And there's a couple different uh, air conditioner kits you can get for this one. I forgot who the manufacturer of this one was. But uh, it's got a uh, 
compressor aft of the uh, transmission that's uh, gear driven. And then it has the lines which goes back, and you have the condenser and so forth. Battery. Right. And it works really well. Of course, it has a regular you know, fan blower and it has bleeder heat like all, all other aircraft have. Unlike uh, most of the Bell helicopters, it's got the refilling port on the uh, left side. Oh, yeah, you know, just little things that are sort, <laughs> sort of obvious. Yeah. Well, I don't know how many times when we, we were flying Bell 430s and 47s where the fuel port's on the right side. Uh -huh. you, you walk around sometimes, oh, yeah, I need to be on the left side. Yeah. <laughs> But it holds 187 gallons of fuel total, and uh, we normally... What's the rate or endurance? Uh, we burn a gallon a minute. Okay. And so, uh, you know... 187 minutes, all right, uh, okay. So, uh, normally I have uh, loaded on here for mission configuration about 100 gallons in the main tank, and I have, uh, we have supply tank slash uh, emergency fuel, that's 15 on each side, uh -huh. and so that's, you know, like 130 gallons. Uh -huh. So, 130 gallons to flame out. Okay, speaking. gotcha. Yeah. Now, where is the actual? Are, are the tank? There multiple tanks, or is there one main tank? You, or? you, got, you got a main tank and it's in, the, in the floor of the aircraft. Okay. And sort of, uh, sort of, well, they're flat, obviously, and they extend forward. And then you have supply tanks on either side. Each supply tank has 50, 15 gallons. Are those like ox tanks or options, or are they just no, most DCs have them? No, it's interesting. In the in the main tanks, there are two transfer pumps, and then on the supply tanks, there are two transfer pumps. Uh -huh. If the, uh, I mean, basically the, the main tanks are continually trying to supply and, and do supply, uh -huh. either one can supply enough fuel to reach the supply tanks to keep both engines running. Uh -huh. And so uh, you have redundancy there. So four transfer pumps, and then the, uh, so what's uh, can, happening is the main, main tank is going into the supply tanks at all times. Okay, can the, uh, you turn off all the boost pumps, and then the main engine driven pump will supply the fuel. But the boost pumps helps. I mean, it's like in most any turbine system, yeah. right? Okay. So you have four electrically driven uh, transfer right. pumps. Right, transfer pumps. And they're, and they're all identical, which is nice. Gotcha. Uh, and of course, uh, same thing here. You got another engine on this side. The aircraft can fly uh, single engine easily, 90 knots, uh, which is not, not so bad. Oh, yeah. Uh, IFR, I'm not really worried about uh, one engine. And uh, definitely VFR, I'm not worried about one engine. As, Access the sides of the aircraft. Oh, yeah, footsteps. To, uh, to uh, access just about any place here you might need to reach. And then another step to in the head. That's a fully rigid head, correct? Well, they don't call it that. But well, essentially it is. Okay. Uh, it does have uh, stabilization. But yeah, it has, it's very similar, to, I'm told, uh, some of the vocab products, but we, we do fly with stabilization at all times. Okay. Now, here's the other oxygen tank here, same capacity as the right side. Here's the med crew station, the paramedic normally sits here, and then uh, the patient's head would be here. Uh, their primary concern is... Uh, Head trauma, airways, so. and gotcha. you know, making sure the patient can breathe. Yeah. And then they medicate the patient as they need to, and they have all the gear that they need to have. They have oxygen supply here on this side and the other side identically. And uh, we got their radios and they got their uh, uh, various medical tools and supplies back there. What's the average flight time from uh, pickup to hospital for trauma? Obviously, you're doing severe cases. Right. So. Well, well our nearest trauma center. From here will be uh, UT Medical Center in Knoxville, about uh, 36 miles away. On any given day, we can get there in 16 minutes. Okay. Yeah, you know, nice. once we get in the air. And uh, typical get in the air time, even IFR should be about seven minutes. Uh huh. You know, unless there's some complication with the destination or something a long way. Right. So uh, anyway, VFR easily in the air, five minutes, and then get to Knoxville, which would be a trauma center. 16 minutes. Other trauma centers that we go to usually are uh, Chattanooga. Yeah, I was going to say, Chattanooga is not that far away. Yeah. And then we also go to Vanderbilt Medical Center in Nashville. Also service Atlanta, uh, Grady Medical Center, which is about an uh, hour and 15 minutes today. Uh -huh. And we also go to the Burns Center in uh, Augusta. It's about an hour and 22 minutes today. Oh, wow. And winds are normally out of the northwest. And a lot of times... Yeah, you can get help. Right. A lot of times we can go to Atlanta or Augusta faster than we can go to Nashville. Right, get us, exactly. 
especially if it's a strong weather system, that may determine where you're going Absolutely. sometime. Okay. Strong That's, weather system or just winds. Right. Uh, okay, I'm going to pause this. Okay.